Know what your passion is, know what lights you up, know what creates the sparkle in your eye. It doesn't have to be your career, it could be a hobby, it could be something you love to do on the side. Just know it. I think there's too many people that don't know it. I'm here today with Jen Salata, who's a writer, a director, and a producer for both television and now, as we may discuss a little bit later, an animated feature. Your three most notable credits are, of course, The Office, Cobra Kai, which, you know, we may have something in common, our paths may have crossed in the past, uh, and now Abbott Elementary. But most importantly, and no discredit to your past experience, but by far the most notable thing you have ever done in your entire career is playing a shroot. So how exciting is it to say that you can officially call yourself a member of the Shroot family? It is by far the best thing I've ever done. Yeah, I um, I wanted to be a Shroot so badly. I love Dwight. I love the Shroots. And uh, on The Office, as much as I love writing, as much as I love directing, I was obsessed with being a Shroot. I would... As you know, with The Office, uh, Greg Daniels would put the writers in roles and I never got a super juicy role, but they would offer me waitress and, you know, nurse and passerby. And I just said shrewd or nothing for five years. <laughs> Good for you. Well, you, we, we might be talking about the idea of playing a game of chess with your career instead of a game of checkers. And there's a game of chess right there. But frankly, after playing a shrewd in the finale, like, how do you even go on with your career? Like, how do you wake up in the morning knowing you're never going to top? that I can't I, yeah I don't know what I'm doing I don't know what I'm gaming for I, I don't know it's over but yeah I, I there was a there was a gif of John Krasinski at some point and I was in the background of it as a shrewd and I was like all right now I'm in gifts like what what else I, it what else can I do? <laughs> yeah, it, do, it doesn't get any better than that, or perhaps it does, and we're going to talk all about that today. Uh, but Jen, it is a pleasure to have you here. Um, you and I have uh, have had the experience more than once of being locked in a small, dark editing room, solving the many myriad of challenges that come along with putting together the show Cobra Kai. And I know everybody watches the finished product and they think, oh, this looks like a fun little show to work on. People <laughs> have no idea what a complicated show it is to put together, um, and somehow you make it look simple. Oh, so I well, I want to talk more about your creative process today. I want to talk about things as far as like how to manage your mental health and how to, you know, really address the fact that perhaps the thing that's standing in our own way in life more than anything else, probably ourselves, you know, yep. look in the mirror, you're going to see what your biggest <laughs> obstacle is um, and just how you use your process to kind of work through those things and more. But well, where I want to get started is this kind of the, the first place that everybody wants to get started is I want to know the origin story. Ah. So let's talk a little bit more about your origin story and how you became the Jen Salata. <laughs> oh, thank you for putting the in front of it. <laughs> so I grew up in Maryland and I came from a very sciencey family. I was very much interested in science and kind of nerdy when I was a kid. Um, my dad is a retired electron physicist um, who had a nanotechnology, nanofab and nanolab at a place called NIST. And my mom was a, just, just retired, a child and adolescent psychologist. And my brother, mechanical engineer, <laughs> I just kind of... I went to adventures in science when I was little. I loved science, but I also loved comedy. I begged to stay up and watch Faulty Towers and Letterman. And I just, I, I just loved humor. And, and I would, you know, uh, if I would be helping with dinner, I would do a character of a waitress and I would make stories up all the time. Uh, I made up a very complicated story of a counselor at my school in elementary school. I said that she was getting engaged and then she was getting married and then she was going on a honeymoon in Africa. And I made up this whole story so that my parents, I, I, I didn't remember this, but my parents said they ran into her years later and they asked about it. And she said, none of it ever happened. Somehow I got my brother to go along with it as well. So I, I think imagination um, was a big part of my childhood. I just really loved it. I started taking improv classes. I was really obsessed with improv. Um, and I knew, and I find this strange, but I don't know if it is strange. I knew from a super early age that I didn't want a nine to five job that was the same every day. I like really knew I wanted that before I almost knew. I knew I liked creativity, imagination. I loved humor. I loved storytelling. But I just felt like if I had to go into the same job every day and do the exact same thing, 
I couldn't do it. And I, I think that I had that awareness at like 10. <laughs> so I find that, you know, I don't know. And it, it still is a thing to this day, but that was sort of kind of what clicked into me first. Um, yeah. So then, um, I, uh, went to Boston university and studied television and film, did an internship in London on a TV show, had some internships in Boston, moved out and had the TV Academy internship, uh, and got on home improvement a long time ago. So that was sort of, <laughs> that was sort of, uh, that was sort of it. I could tell a story about like my first day in production because I think it might, um, interest you and also kind of horrify you. <laughs> all right. I definitely want to hear all about your first day in production. Yeah. Um, but you just fast forwarded through yeah. so many amazing yeah. things. I love it when I ask people the origin story, like, well, I went to school here and then I did this thing. And then, yeah, you know, right. I did A, B and C and now I'm here and I'm successful. And I'm like, it's going to take me 90 minutes just to fill all the gaps in your story. Right. I so can the, go into the, any of them. I'm sure you could. The, the two things that I'm really interested by just as far as where you ended up is that number one must have had fascinating dinner table conversations with all the people in your family. But <laughs> number two, I would imagine that given you have such highly analytical minds, whether it's about psychology, whether it's about engineering or physics or whatever it might be, even though um, it's not to say the people that do work like that aren't creative, but it's a different part of the brain. Mm. I would imagine that it wasn't as easy as it could have been to all of a sudden be the actor, the creative, the writer in a household full of quote unquote professionals. You know, it's fascinating. Yes. Yes. And no. Like what was really interesting was I do think my parents who, you know, both got their doctorates and were a very educational path, they were worried, especially my dad, of like, how am I going to make money at this? I think that was the thing that was really difficult as like parents wanting me to wanting me to pursue my dreams, wanting me to do whatever I wanted to do, but also being nervous about that. But there was a lot of imagination in my family, like when I would tell stories, my brother would come up with inventions at the table and my dad would encourage that. So there was a lot of like thinking about new ideas, even though some were in science and some were kind of comic, but so, yeah, so it was like, it, it, it and I, I, there was, I have a friend, um, Lindsay Duran, who's a producer, fantastic producer who works uh, often in animation. And she also is a ghostwriter for a lot of movies. She helps with story. She gets paid to do story on huge movies, but nobody like really knows it. It's a quiet cake. And she wrote a book about like, what did you get from your parents? Like, what is the mm. thing that when you think about your parents, what do you feel like you got from them? And I was flipping through the book and a lot of them were like, remember to put air in your tires <laughs> and never, uh, some of them were like, know your place. And I felt like my takeaway from them is you can do anything which I didn't realize how extraordinarily lucky I was to have that as a beginning. Um, she told me JJ Abrams' parents said, did the same thing with him, that, that, mm -hmm. that his, his answer was exactly the same. But a lot of the answers were what parents instilled that you couldn't do. So I was so lucky to the point where I think when I started to struggle in some class in college, I called them and I'm like, I can't do everything. <laughs> like I can't do anything. There's some, there's things I can't do. I mean, clearly there's much I can't do, but I think that the idea that I could pursue what I wanted to pursue and have that freedom was like a, a, a big gift. And I took it for granted because I have friends who feel like they're a little bit in more in boxes. Yeah, I think that it's very common for people to often feel like they're on somebody else's path until they realize how detrimental that is to their health and their well-being. So there's no question that that was a gift to have been told you can pursue anything that you want and you can do anything. Mm -hmm. What I'm curious about is do you feel that by the age of 10, when you realize I don't want to do an office and work nine to five, which, by the way, the irony of that in the show that you've worked on, right? Um, <laughs> but given that you were so young at that point where most people don't even make this discovery either ever or until they're in their 30s or 40s. And to be perfectly frank, I built an entire business model on helping people when they have this discovery, realizing, oh, crap, I'm 40 and I didn't realize this isn't what I want to do with my life, right? Oh, but yeah. having said that, do you think that that just came from you internally? Or do you think that message also either came from your parents or from the model that your parents created, because I would guess they were largely going to offices and doing the same thing nine to five. This is fascinating. You're asking such good questions. Yes, I think like, I think what's interesting is they did have more of a nine to five job. My mom had a private practice, so she could kind of, you know, you know, do things. She also taught a little bit, but she could kind of coordinate her hours. 
Um, both of my parents like challenge and they like to be, um, they like to be pushed. And my dad both did, um, physics. And then he kind of was doing more, he was doing scanning, tunneling microscopy, and then he was doing like nanotechnology and then he was doing management. So he, within his field kind of bumped around. So diff, diff, I was more of the black sheep of exactly what you're saying. They were more, but their, their, their temperaments were to take on things. And this is a thing that I think is extremely important. Take on things that they were passionate about. They didn't do, and I completely understand the privilege of being able to do what you want to do. Do you know what I mean? I didn't have to worry about my health. I didn't have to worry about um, being able to afford maybe to go to a college that could set me up for an internship that could get me in the door. So I know how many things I, I am so grateful that happened to me, but I constantly felt like I needed to follow the thing that really lit me up and, and, and they both do that in spades. And so, and my brother took a little bit of a path into a little bit more of a, I'm good at this and I can make money at this and a, a career and then did it and thought, oh, I'm not as excited about this and made that change in his twenties, but then went back to school and got his master's in engineering and then went for that. So we all sort of <laughs> found it <laughs> eventually. Well, the, I've had this conversation multiple times with other, whether it was various experts or just regular people that are working in the industry just to get their take on it. And in the world of careers and the world of, you know, creating your vision and manifesting your destiny and all the other stuff that's out there in the world, um, follow your passion is a very divisive topic. You never oh. would have guessed it. Oh, no. But there are some people that say, oh, you absolutely must follow your passion and it's the only way to create the life that you want. And then there are other people that say, following your passion is the worst possible advice you could give somebody because what if somebody is passionate about something that they neither have the skill nor can they create a career or an income out of it mm -hmm. so okay, given yeah. that's your advice i want to dissect this yes. a little bit okay, more because so it can be dangerous i said it probably too generally because i do follow it up and it really depends on who i'm talking to and this would this i think would be what i would say to that know what your passion is, know what lights you up, know what creates the sparkle in your eye. Doesn't have to be your career, could be a hobby, could be something you love to do on the side, just know it. I think there's too many people that don't know it. You can know it and not go for it for financial reasons. You have kids and you can't afford to become a ventriloquist um, when you have you know 15 kids and there's not a lot of money in ventriloquism. I'm sorry if there is, I don't know. There, are, there may be. I'm gonna have to get a ventriloquist on the show to really dissect that career <laughs> really path. That could be interesting. Interesting. Find it and report back because it's possible. But I, I do think you have to be practical, but I bump into way more often people who don't know what they love because they immediately start to think of other things besides what they enjoy. And for me, it's possible. So I'll, I'll say a couple of things here. It's possible that partly um, I have ADD, I have a bit of anxiety and OCD. I think that with ADHD and procrastination, sometimes the challenge is like the excitement and the challenge needs to be there or I won't do a great job. Like I have to be challenged. I have to be, it has to be hard. It has to be tough. It has to be inventive or I, I lose steam. So I've sort of noticed that about myself. So maybe for me, it's even more important, but I found that so many people are not in touch with what it is that they love. I've, I've gotten to so many people who are on a path, like you were saying, but this has just happened to me personally. And I find out that they're in it for, you know, 12 years into a path, they're not interested in it. And then, uh, you know, maybe I have one friend, I have one friend who was going to be a pharmacist and uh, she was really stuck on deciding whether she wanted to go into research or she wanted to go, you know, uh, I think do a clinical or, or be a pharmacist at like a Wal Walgreens or whatever. And she was stuck, stuck, stuck. And for like a year, she was stuck. And then finally I asked her, you know, because I knew she was stuck. I was like, is it possible you don't want to be a pharmacist? And she just like started crying. You know what I mean? But like it, she at that moment, it's like it was tucked down in her. And then so we started talking about it and she's crying and she's like, and then I'm trying to figure out she's ridiculously low. I mean, has loans, $200,000 in loans that she needs to pay back. So there's going to be a practical component to, she's going to have to probably be a pharmacist for a while to pay back the money to whatever. But after an hour of the, talking about that and which way she can do things and what's the most interesting way she can find to do the thing that she didn't really want to do in the first place, I 
almost didn't ask this question, but I was, because <laughs> I thought we've already kind of shaken her a little. I said, do you know what it is you want to do? And she kind of looked up to me and her eyes lit up for the first time I've ever seen. And she said, yes. And I was like, what is it? And she said, fashion. <laughs> So, so here's the thing. She found a job in pharmacy that she likes. She's trying to work for a fashion brand in her weekends and in her free time. And if she can ever make the jump, she will, but she's able to realize what it is. And I think realizing what it is doesn't mean you need to go for it, but I think so many people don't realize what it is and they're, and, and so, yeah, but I would be curious to hear the people who think it's a is that just a bad idea because maybe they don't have the skill or the ability and they have financial responsibilities, then you just can't, you can't do it. But I think it's better to know and not do it than to not ask yourself that question. Yeah, I, I love all of this. And uh, one of the things that I've been discovering about just myself over the course of the last couple of years, and this is something that we will eventually relate to the work that you do as a writer and a director and a producer, but I'm going to make this about me for a second. Um, you know, my microphone, my show, I'm going to make it about me. It. What I found uh, is that I've actually done several conversations recently uh, with people in completely different fields where they've all said the same thing to me based on the challenge that I'm running into. They're like, are you writing and are you journaling? I'm like, no, I don't write and I journal. And they were they were talking to me about using that as a process. And then I had a guest recently that's like, you've been writing a weekly newsletter for eight years and you've released over 300 podcasts. Do you think that maybe that's your way of working through life and better understanding it? And I was like, bing, like giant light bulb moment. And I say all of that because I workshop ideas by having amazing and fascinating conversations with people. Oh, and I've been trying to solve this equation. Should you follow your passion? And I think you just helped me clarify something. And I want to workshop this with you. Yeah. I don't think it's just like if you're going to choose a career path, you have to follow your passion. I do think there's a danger in that. Yeah. I think you have to design a life around fueling whatever that passion is. And in your friend's case, she can be a pharmacist such that the means justify the ends of fueling her passion for fashion, which for now means she could be using a little bit of her paycheck to work towards learning more about fashion or taking classes on fashion. But when you have that creative side of you, if you tamp it down and you don't feel it, you are miserable, your well-being plummets, the anxiety skyrockets. I can very much relate to the ADHD and how if something isn't really challenging and fascinating to me, it bores me to tears, like literally bores me to tears and I shake from anxiety <laughs> Saying I cannot do this for one more minute. <laughs> so like, for example, if, if I were to follow my passion and make money following the passion, I'd have to find a way to make a living being a professional ninja. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen me on a ninja course. That shit is never going to happen. Nobody has ever said, oh my God, look at that athlete. They're like, oh, look at the old bald guy that's doing cool ninja stuff. Good for him, right? Uh, I, I, do, I don't think so. I've seen you. You are fantastic. And if there was ever a ninja editor, you would crush. <laughs> Well, that that I very much appreciate. But the, the idea being that if I took that out of my life, even though it, I don't make any money doing it, it fuels who I am and it's helped me workshop and identify what's the process for achieving incredibly difficult goals. So I think it's really you need to make sure, like you said, you want to follow what lights you up. And you want to fuel your passion, but it doesn't mean your career no. has to be your passion. It if it can be great. It definitely doesn't have to. And I think that's where people get stuck. And I think that that's, you can be work-life balance where you want to have a nine to five job. That's something that you just like because it brings in the money and then you can spend more time with your kids. You can spend more time traveling. You can spend more time doing whatever you want. I a hundred percent. I just think it's like, I just run into so many people that, you know, are so out of touch with what it is that they want because they've never asked themselves that. And I think it's better to ask yourself and maybe not be able to pursue it in the most ideal way, but at least to be in touch with it. You my, um, my grandfather started sculpting when he was 80. Do you know what I mean? That I love when I see that kind of stuff, when I see people like who have never taken an art class and have never thought they could do that, decide, you know, this seems like fun. And then just kind of, it, 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 yeah, it can be a hobby, can be, can be, uh, you know, just something you read about, you know, it, it can be anything, but I think that you should honor that side of you. If you're lucky enough to be able to, I know that there's situations where you can't, and I completely know that it's a blessed situation for me to be able to follow what I love. And I think that uh, another thing that's so important here is it's not just a matter of a lot of people haven't asked the question of themselves, right. what am I passionate about or what lights me up? Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people don't feel like they're allowed to. 
Oh, a hundred percent. Yes. Yes. They either haven't asked the question. They don't think they can, or they, so there was something that I learned from my dad when we were doing something on the office, we were trying to decide whether Jim's proposal should to Pam should have sound or no sound. It was this unbelievable dis- discussion that went over about two months. We had, we built a $300,000 set because we couldn't find a gas station set to have Jim d- get down on one knee and propose to her. And we had this rain coming down. And basically there were people on two sides of this. The writer's room was split down the middle. Greg Daniels' family was split down the middle. He had a list of people and his wife and one kid was on one side and the two other kids were on the other side of whether or not we should just hear the rain, see Jim go down for this moment and just kind of imagine what he says to her because what is he going to say that's so different from what other people do or uh, hear it. And we went back and forth and back and forth. And my dad talked to me about the difference between offensive and defensive decision-making. And defensive, dis- offensive decision-making is where, again, I'm blessed and fortunate enough to spend a lot of my t- time, you know, but I do things to, in addition to being lucky, I do things to be able to continue to do what I'm doing. Um, but he said with offensive decision-making, it's what do you think is good? What do you want? What is your instinct? What lights you up? What are you feeling? What's your gut? All of those. Defensive is what, are the, what is the audience going to think? How are people going to feel? Are the critics going to like it? Everybody's been waiting so long for this. You're going to do this and you're going to, what if it's the wrong thing? What if it's, and immediately I knew that I have some friends who operate a little bit more in that for a lot of their decisions, just thinking about the reasons why not. And again, there's some very valid reasons why not, but don't spend any time in the kind of what is the reason, what is my gut, what is my instinct, what is my, yeah. So it's like, and I kind of love personally as a friend, I've only seen good things happen when people get more in touch with that side. I haven't seen, well, now I know and I can't do it. Ugh, you know, I haven't seen, I haven't quite seen that because it's some, Mm -hmm. it, it starts to happen in some form, but I don't know. Well, and what's interesting to me, and uh, I'm afraid that this is going to end up being a 17 part podcast. If we get too deep into the office specifically, we clearly want to talk about it some, um, right. but I'm already fascinated by this conversation. We haven't even gotten to the first day on the job yet. Um, <laughs> Pin is still in there. Haven't forgotten about it's it. Not, it's not. Um, it's not. It's not to be as good as the office. No, story. no, no. Trust me. We're, we're going to get there. Well, we're going to cover it for sure. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting to me, and this is actually helping me better understand now, what's different about the office, right? This, this. There's something about it that I think even the best of us have a hard time putting our finger on. And I'm going to give you two very specific examples that I just thought of based on this conversation that you were having, because it's not just about well, it's good characters or it's good writing or good actors. All that matters. Mm-hmm. But the hero heuristics that we use as writers and creators make a big difference. And using this offensive versus defensive uh, creativity means it led to number one, the decision that we're going to confidently not have sound for the proposal. And there's one other thing, and I don't know if this had a million back and forths as well, but with the Jim and Pam storyline at the very, very end, we never know what was on the little letter that was in the teapot. Right. And I've heard stories behind the scenes from Jen afterwards about what actually was there. But to this day, it's just like, but I want to know what was on it. I bet that was a discussion. So it is a discussion crazily. And I, I, if you were just thinking this, you are not the first. When I talk about this story, people think we did do it without sound. We did it with sound. Mm-hmm. We did it with sound. But I was strongly on the no sound side. And I want to tell you a story about that in a second. But But what they did is they saved that moment. The teapot already had that, which I love that we don't get to know. I love that because there's some part of it that relies on the audience's imagination. My idea for the no sound is what is what is Jim going to say that we, then somebody else is going to say? He's down on one knee and it seems so beautiful and respectful of a private moment to have us not be able to hear just that little bit, to hear the pouring rain. It's really far away. It's on a long lens, you know, just to have that. If he was going to say something super specific, you know, but it why he wasn't, you know? So I think that that sort of pointed to that. Um, but they did save that moment for when Pam says goodbye to Michael. Uh, she didn't have her microphone on. And she'd said, she said, she won't say what she said, but she basically said goodbye to Steve. 
Yeah. And I, and I love all of that. And <laughs> what, what I've really learned, and this is something that I kept asking myself while uh, editing Cobra Kai, because mm -hmm. it's such a unique and different experience. Mm -hmm. And I've said this even to John, Josh and Hayden, I've said this publicly, the show has no business being as good as it is. Like, come on, like five consistent seasons of mm -hmm. taking the karate kid from 30 plus years ago. Like the show should have sucked from the pilot. It just should <laughs> have. Like mm -hmm. I hate watched the pilot and hate watched the first season until I'm like, all right, fine. This is awesome. And then yeah. I decided I have to work on it. Right. But it had no business being that good. And I've really tried to understand what's the difference. And it's all about the ability of the people that are in charge creatively of making choices because mm -hmm. there's a million and a half choices throughout any given day. Yep. And one of the core foundations that I share with people, and it doesn't matter if it's writing or editing or directing or becoming a ninja warrior. Or like I, I was giving this uh, lesson to my Spartan racers that I'm training for their first Spartan race. Oh, how cool. you do anything is how you do everything. Uh, right. And that applies to how you create the entire life around you, which, by the way, I'm hoping is the perfect segue to the first day in your job and going back to being a PA. <laughs> oh, this is interesting. Well, you're going to, there may be some judgment in here of how I did this, but it is how I do everything. Um, uh, but it was, I was an in, a intern or a PA in Boston on a commercial and it was my first day in production. I think I was between my junior and senior year. I'm not quite sure of, of college. Uh, there were two interns, or I'm going to say PA. I think we were PA. So there were two PAs. We were going to, uh, there was a, a lake and they wanted to shoot, uh, um, a house and they, they wanted to shoot the lake and then the house. So the first thing that happened day one is they asked myself and another PA to get into a canoe and to get the gunk off the lake. <laughs> so <laughs> we get into the lake, get into the canoe and we start kind of scooping it up and putting it into the new canoe because that's how it's going to work. There was a producer who just started screaming at us that that's not what we were supposed to do. We were supposed to hit the, hit the gunk with the paddle. We knew that there was no way to actually make this happen with what they were telling us to do. However, this was like the first day, you know, you want to, not in an unreasonable way, but you want to try to be able to do a good job and get the job done. And if they're asking us to do something crazy, we wouldn't have. So we basically started scooping it in and slamming it, but basically scooping it when they weren't looking because we needed to get rid of it. And we also would like to have this recommendation for later. But then, the next thing that we had to do, um, the next thing that I had to do was they wanted to shoot through a tree, but there were no trees in the right position. So they wanted me to run into the forest and grab a tree branch. And this haunts me based on what I'm working on now. But I ran into the forest and I was like, what kind of forest doesn't have branches on the ground? Where are the branches? And I'm like running around. And this is like fast. I mean, I'm just like, I have to find a branch. I have to find a branch. Oh, sorry about this, but I grab a branch from a tree and I start twisting and twisting and twisting and trying to get it off. And they're like screaming, like, we need a branch. We need a branch. I bit the branch off the tree. <laughs> I bit a branch off the tree to get it to them. <laughs> so, and then they shot through the branch, shot over the lake, shot through the house and they were happy. Now, what does that say about me? <laughs> like if they had asked me to do anything critic ridiculous or any sort of like, obviously like me too, or anything like that, hard, no, like hard, no, you respect yourself. I also think that probably I shouldn't have bit the tree, but, um, but I tried to figure out a way to do the job that I was asked to do in a good way that I could do it. And I, this way is a weird thing to say above and beyond because I was destroying a tree. But uh, you know what I mean? Like I was really trying to get them what they wanted. But also there was a tiny bit of navigating, not screaming back at the producer. That's not going to work at the first step of day one. Anyway. But essentially, you decided that whatever it takes, we're going to make this shot work, even though you weren't setting the shot, you weren't the director, the writer, the producer. It's I understand that in order for them to get the best shot, I got to clean up all the muck on the lake and I need to break a tree branch off or in your case, literally bite it. Bite it right. I'm glad that your dad isn't a dentist. I bet he would have had a field day with my that. My grandpa was. My grandpa or your was. grandpa was, you know, so so I'm sure that they were very upset about that as well. Um, but realizing that whatever it takes to get the shot and tell the story. And it yep. sounds like that trend is pretty much continued from day one of your job. 
I learned early on, and I already did this, but it's exactly what you said is how you do something is how you do everything. And what I saw was a number of PAs were constantly, when a writer would come out and ask them what they wanted to do, they would say, I want to be a writer. And they'd say, can we read one of your scripts? And he said, oh, I had, I have 30 scripts. They're all great. And they, and basically what I found out is on home improvement, I was an intern assistant PA, an intern PA assistant, writer's assistant, and a writer for the last two years of my show. So that, that years of that show. So it was one, my first show. And I was able to do that. And basically they saw my, I guess, comedic sensibility and they saw that I cared, but they basically said that when I was a PA, I was doing everything with the care or excitement or passion because, and I, and I didn't have to manufacture that. And so when other people say, how do I do this? Like, I don't want to do this. And, and I, I wanted to do it. I, I mean, I was so grateful to be, have a foot in the door in the industry. I was working with good people. Like one of my first things was they said they didn't want to really figure out what Wilson said and did in his yard, the guy with the fence. And I, I did it. So I spent my time, you know, doing assistant errands and then doing that. But I just, threw myself into it and I loved it. And, but I didn't have to pretend I loved it in order to try to get what I want. And I truly loved it. And I just think either something's wrong with me or, or just whatever it is, it worked to my advantage because then they said, well, if we give her something else. She's going to attack it with the same, you know, skill set or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whatever. And that, that just, that uh, goes a little bit deeper for me into one of the, the core pieces of advice that I often give people earlier in their career, where mm -hmm. they're so hyper-focused on what the show is that they need to be working on or this job or whatever. And there is a so certain point where this advice doesn't apply anymore, but especially in the early days of your career, I really believe that where you're doing the job and the people around whom you're doing your job is more important than what you're doing. Because if you display character and you display how you do something, they will notice and they they will put you in the place where you provide them the most value. A hundred percent. That is so cool. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and I tell people that too, but not as eloquently. Well, you know, like I said, I work through all this stuff and workshop it every single day, all day in coaching and in the podcast. So, you know, I found a way to say it more succinctly. If we go back a hundred episodes, I probably said it in a really roundabout, shitty, you know, total nonsense way. Perfect. Um, so uh, another curious question that I have, I haven't even really gotten to my agenda yet. I just, I'm fascinated by talking to you. And I know that you as, as a TV director, you probably have lunches with editors like three days a week, but I still like one of my favorite lunches ever was the first day that you and I met on episode 208 of Cobra Kai. I still remember the day we had lunch and just loved it and glad we're finally getting this uh, on the record. Um, but one of the other things I'm fascinated by just as far as who you've become and the work that you've done, do you think that it's a total coincidence just based on who you know, being in the right place at the right time, that you knew by age 10, you never wanted to work a nine to five and be in an office. And the defining job of your career is about the misery of working nine to five in an office. <laughs> I think that I think that I was able to thrive there because I have that unbelievable frustration. And I feel like like even in writing, if I feel like somebody calls me to write a movie where it's just so predictable, I feel like this is such, I hear myself saying this when I'm just I'm going to stop saying it. But I, again, realize how lucky and privileged I am because I feel like there's just walls coming up around me when I feel like I get bored and I get I feel claustrophobic. And like uh, one of the things I gave uh, that I turned a lot of me went into the office and the stories would just come from my life and go in there. And one was there was a cold open where this little cube was bouncing around the screen. Oh, we all and, know that episode. Oh, yes. And I saw it bounce in the corner, but I was waiting forever to see it. Nobody was in the room and nobody believed I saw it. And I was telling everybody that I saw it. So then I was like, how do I make this into a cold open? And I thought everyone's going to be cheering and excited, but you find those. I spent a lot of my life when I was sort of bored in situations using, trying to find small little moments of beauty or humor in things that were just very, um, you know, very small, you know, I, 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 I felt like smaller things had more meaning to me, people being stuck together, people kind of having to get to know each other because of proximity is very interesting to me as well. So I think, yeah, I think that I was lucky enough to get on that show. I wrote a short story that got me on that show. Actually, it was about a woman who fell in love with the middle of a man. And I can, I was going to talk about the process of actually writing that because it's part of my, like, how to creatively get, keep yourself on track and help yourself. Um, actually, I'll just stop. I'll tell you that tiniest little bit of that now is that um, 
uh, I was trying, I was in between shows. I wanted to write something original. I was scared because I'd been writing other people's characters for so long. And I think my fear was, what if I don't have anything to say? Like, right. What if I, I thought I did, cause I was doing characters when I was younger, but I had just been writing other people's characters for so long, starting to learn about story, learning about characters through being in rooms, seeing what works, what doesn't work, but what do I have to say? And I said, I was going to write eight hours a day and it wasn't happening. And then I said, I was going to write six hours a day and it wasn't happening. And my mom kept saying, make tiny goals, make a goal where you can win. You have to make a goal where you can win. So, so I was like, I'm doing four hours a day, three hours a day, two hours a day. It was not happening. And this is embarrassing, right? This is embarrassing. I'm a professional writer. I've been paid for like 10 years to write at this point. She told me to do 10 minutes a day. And I laughed at her for about five months (laughs) and then fine, but I wasn't getting anything done. And I was stressed that I wasn't getting anything done. I finally sat down for 10 minutes and nothing came of that first day, but I sat down and I was so proud that I sat down for, I was truly actually not kidding, proud. <laughs> then the second day I sat down and I was at a coffee shop and I was like looking at someone who was buying a coffee and I saw their feet and I was wondering how much you could tell about someone from their feet. And then I sort of thought it was a little cliche. And then I went up their body and I stopped at their middle their torso. And then I thought, I wonder how much you can tell about somebody from their torso. And then I wrote a story about a woman who falls in love with the middle of a man. She works in a button factory in quality control. And she sees the middle of people walking by because there's a big, large window, but the top is by is, is, um, has a banner and the bottom is newspaper machines. But she sees this confident strut. She sees this coffee order. That's the same. And she sees the financial times opened up every day. And she puts all her hopes and dreams and love into this guy, even though there's somebody boring in the factory that likes her and she's not interested. Anyway, I wrote that story. That was the first kind of original thing I wrote. Uh, I sent it to, I mean, my agent sent it out and I, Suzanne Daniels, um, we know from Cobra Kai early on, uh, is Greg Daniels' wife. She picked it up from a stack of scripts. And honestly, I think it's because mine was a short story. It was thinner. It was like going to be much easier than to read a thick script. She liked it, told Greg to write, to read it. And that's how I got that job. But it was, there was a little bit of claustrophobic feeling in that button factory and the outside and the window and the imagination making a situation that's small, kind of more enjoyable. And I feel like a lot of people in the office did do that. Um, But also I really learned my lesson to not make fun of making your goal smaller and smaller until you can actually achieve it. And then you don't, I mean, I write much more than 10 minutes a day now, but I had to make it doable. Um, that was a lot of stories mixed. No, in. no, that was that was fantastic. Number one, I have to read this short story because oh, um, there, there are so. I mean, it's you and I have so many similarities, just the way that we see the world. Oh. Um, you know, like so, it, it's just so funny. Like what I was thinking while you were telling that yeah. was going into the deepest, darkest depths of my psyche and asking myself, why is it that I struggle with any time I gain weight, I judge myself. Right. Because it's the middle of the torso. And I'm thinking to me, it's not about the image. It's not about the six pack is that if I look at the middle of somebody's torso, you can judge how they live their life based on their habits, based on what they eat, based on how much they move. You can Mm. see most of it in their torso. That's what was going through my mind. So you and I have that whole same ADHD, like just going down these rabbit holes, right? Um, (laughs) um, But what, what I was also thinking about is that looking specifically at this idea of somebody in a button factory and having this really unique way of passing the time it just mm-hmm. reminds you of all the crazy shit that jim was doing to, to um dwight for example where i mean i would guess that if there was anybody that was as close to what you dealt with or how you felt about an office it would have been jim because he was the every man that was like oh i'm just here for a paycheck for a few months and then it ends up becoming his entire life and his identity and he multiple yeah. times goes through that identity crisis so yeah. i can see that short story if i were greg daniels and like you get these characters Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, out of boredom comes imagination, I think. (laughs) So I was able to tap into that. Um, yeah, I was definitely able to tap into that. I mean, another cold open happened because Greg and I were supposed to write a, just reminded me by saying, Greg, like had to write a, a a script together and I kind of procrastinated. I didn't know how, what his style was for writing. And I found that we were both kind of procrastinating. I don't know if that's his norm because I'd never written with him before, but all of a sudden I was complaining about my ear. He had some sort of shoulder thing going on. We looked up WebMD and he was putting like some oil from the kitchen in my ear to try to cure me. And he, we were trying to diagnose his shoulder thing and we just turned it into a 
cold open where Michael and Dwight are on WebMD and Dwight thinks he has a problem with his uterus like, <laughs> pointing to that area of the body. So there's just like, but that's what you do in a, also in a writer's room. Like, even though it's interesting and it's different, a lot of it is sitting there for 12 hours a day, 10 hours a day with similar people, you know, ordering lunch. It's like, there's a little bit, there's a routine that, that routine changes show to show. Sometimes you're on a show for five years or whatever, but so parts of it change. Other parts of it, when you're sitting and trying to break story are just hard and you try to figure out ways to kind of bring some joy in. <laughs> well, I want to talk a little bit more about using the writing process, similar to what I just talked about with how I've recently discovered I use writing newsletters, writing blog posts, doing podcast interviews. I've realized that I've just been using it as my own therapy to figure out what the hell is the whole purpose of this world and life all about, right? Yeah. Um, but I know that for you, you have a lot of thoughts about how to use writing in the process to manage anxiety, work through issues, so much so, in fact, that at one point, Steve Carell said to you that when I leave, this is going to be hard for you because you're not going to be able to work out a lot of your problems through my character. Is that true? <laughs> yes. Um, a hundred percent. Yes. He said, this is gonna be difficult. Cause I think I have a feeling you work out a lot of stuff through my character. Yes. Yes. So, so this is very interesting because it definitely works that way. It definitely works that way, but it also, okay. So I have, I have both things to say. I haven't spent enough time thinking about how my writing helps me and more how I have to do things to help myself so I can write. So like I, I have many more, I have a lot of thoughts about how I can organize my life and be kind to myself and be patient with myself and meditate and do things that can like allow me to continue, get out of my own way. But yes, um, uh, writing very much uh, allows me to exercise that part of my brain that needs a challenge that gets kind of uh, bo uh, bored, and I need to I need to be able to to do that. And cr like cracking a story is the best feeling in the world. So if it's like I am struggling in anything, you know, personally or whatever, and I try to attempt to write or try to break a story, and then I get that feeling where it's like I just worked hard at it and I did something. It's so weird. I feel like doing a dance. Like it's just this quiet thing that happens in a brain. It's not like I've just sewed somebody back up from surgery and ta-da. Like there's like it's just I know that I sort of figured it out. So I feel like there's a lot of reward in that. Um, uh, so I'm not sure that this story is going to, uh, prove that or be an answer to that question, but I, I found that there was somebody, uh, on the office who I'm very close with. I'm not going to say who it is, but there was somebody who I'm close with. I'm close with a bunch of the writers on the office, but there was somebody where, I, at the first, at the beginning of working together, we kind of like would get a little like that. Oh, not bad and and all safe and good, but it would just be a little like that. And I would notice that, that person would kind of like, you know, like almost bark something and I would kind of, you know, bark back and feel like I needed to defend myself or whatever. And then we would entangle in this thing. And I kind of was like, I don't like this pattern. I need to figure out how I can change my behavior because I can't change this other person. And I knew it didn't take anything personally. I was way past that point in my career, definitely tell you stories from the past, <laughs> but I wasn't at that place. So I ended up Googling and it kills me to say this now because I love them, but like I ended up Googling how to deal with difficult people. And I ended up trying three things over the course of six months. And one was kind of when someone does that, just let it fall. Don't engage, just let it fall. You know, they're just kind of getting upset about something that they're getting upset about. And you don't owe it to anybody. Everybody else is kind of observing this interaction too. You're not stuck in here where you have to kind of, they say A, you say B, you know, you can just let it go. It's not, you don't, you're not weak. You're not less strong because you, but I thought, you know, as a girl in the industry, I gotta, so I just let it go. And then, so there were a couple of techniques. Anyway, about, it worked, it worked. <laughs> like these techniques worked and I was very grateful and felt good. Um, but what ended up happening is uh, a couple of years later on the show, I was sent off without a B story. So I had Phyllis uh, Google how to deal with difficult people and try all the things that I had tried on this writer in the room on Phyllis, I mean, on Angela and did the entire story about this person and they have no idea so like <laughs> even we were, to this day yes oh my god that's hilarious 
<laughs> have no clue because I don't want to ever tell them I Googled how to deal with difficult people because they weren't really difficult, but it was that was the way I had to put it in to figure out how do I stop this pattern from happening? And we're very close, but it was like, yeah, was, yeah, there was a core group of us and I was just like, this is, I need to figure this out. And so, yeah, they never realized that that's what I ended up doing. But I feel like, so I had a thing, I worked through a thing and then I wrote about the thing that I worked through and I feel like it helped other people. So like, it didn't really at that point didn't really help me, but so it, it, it was a little bit back, a little bit backwards, but sometimes I do things therapeutically because I write about something that I'm working through of my own, like, you know, I wrote grief counseling and I, you know, had, had some experiences with grief and I think it did help me that sort of experience. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like, uh, even though you might be doing it in a more fictitious, uh, mm -hmm. more humorous world, it's very similar to my process where as a coach, what I've learned is that whatever advice I'm giving somebody else, the only person that needs to hear it more than the person I'm giving it to is me. 100%. So all the time I'm giving advice, I'm like, I really need to listen to this advice yeah, that I'm giving this person right now because I'm not doing any of these things either. And I just find that uh, having I've had so many conversations, thousands of conversations, whether it's about work life balance or better health or fitness or time management, productivity, career paths. Um. And without me having any specific connection between the call at 9 a.m. and the call at 10 a.m. or what people want to talk about on Wednesday or Friday it all centers around similar themes. And I keep thinking it's a coincidence. And then I'm like, oh, I'm the coincidence. I'm the theme. <laughs> I'm working through the problem and I'm seeing those problems, right? Yeah. But I, I don't know if you've done this, but have you have you accumulated the top, you know, 10 things you've learned from all your interviews? I mean, I'd be curious if you like boiled down like the things that really stick with you or really changed you or really made you be like, oh, I haven't, I, I you know, that really shifted the way I think about things. Cause you're in such a wonderful, I mean, all your listeners as well, in position to sort of hear a myriad of advice, you know, and just kind of pick and choose, you know, these are the things that really resonate. <laughs> it's funny because just recently I forced myself to write that. And it's, it's not basically here are the 10 things that I learned from the podcast, but I wrote uh, this really long newsletter that again, is just me journaling to the public. I've just finally discovered this, um, mm -hmm. but it was essentially the 20 most important or the, the 10 most important lessons I've learned from 20 years of working in Hollywood. Oh, wow. And just as a shameless plug for anybody that wants to know them, it's one of the first emails I send you when you subscribe to my free newsletter. And it's this giant long list of if I were to boil down all these lessons, whether it's through my own failures, through talking about other people's failures, talking through successes, you mm -hmm. follow these 10 things mm -hmm. and you do it consistently, mm -hmm. you're going to be successful. Yeah. But it came from having so many conversations, either with my students or just through my own life. But yes, I, I, I finally just sat down one day and I'm like, I need to distill this into something. Else. It, it, but again, it was just to work through it in my own brain because okay. with ADHD, which I want to get into next, yeah. it just never shuts up. Hmm. Like, would you just go to bed for eight hours a night, yeah. but it doesn't do it. And all these ideas were in my brain. I'm like, I need to get it out. I need to externalize it. Let me break down this list. Now I never even think about it anymore. There's always some do. other I chat. I have to write it down. I have to write it down. I have to get it out. And then it's out. In fact, I, I found this when I was prepping for this, um, things to remember when I'm writing under a deadline. This is my mm. list. I picked it up on my wall and then I got embarrassed because like my housekeeper came and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> some of them are pretty dorky, but I was like, I just need to, I need to remember those things. But I, I just actually, you'd mentioned failure. And I wanted to say too, that back to the passionate thing that I was fortunate enough. And we were saying passion doesn't have to be your career, but passion helped me with my career. And I, because if I, when I did not get asked back to shows, which happened three times out of like 13 shows, um, I wanted it so badly that it didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't even think about doing anything different. You know, I had to get back in. So there was something buoying about having that underlying feeling of or drive and the passion and the excitement for the thing that protected me. Some of my friends who don't like as much what they're doing, you know, like for various reasons, when they hit a problem, it sometimes struggle a bit more because there's not that, oh, there's that lighthouse that they're like, you know, it's just keeping them on course. Yeah. The only thing harder than doing a job that you don't want to do is when you have to solve problems and deal with challenges at a job that you don't want to do. Yes, yes, right. Yes. And it's the opposite because when you actually love what you do, there's nothing you want more than to create new problems to solve. 
which yes. is why I can't work on boring shows. No offense yes. to anybody that works on it or watches it. You couldn't pay me enough to edit NCIS. I just couldn't do it because yeah, it has a formula. You're part of a machine and you get the work done. For some people, it's the perfect career opportunity based on what they need out of their life. Hmm. If I'm not working on something that's kind of a complete and total shit show and they're coming to me saying we had all these things we wanted to do. We couldn't do any of them. Just work with what you have. I'm like, excellent. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons I love Cobra Kai. Obviously, with all the respect in the world, it's a right. really hard show to get yes. in the can because yes. they don't have enough time. They don't have enough money. There's and what they put, what they put on the page, like if people read some of the stuff that's on the page, they're like, Holy shit, this is supposed to be a fight five times bigger than the final version, which, by the way, was awesome. But you've read the pages and I'm sure you've looked at every script. And you're like, what the fuck? Like, how? How are we going to do this in eight days? Like, my, come last, on. my last episode was five oh five. And mm -hmm. there let's I mean, if you do the math on this, let's say it was like a thirty three page script Two, we, we shoot for six days now instead of five days. Right. So we had six days. Two of my days were a 12 hour fight scene, two days. And how much page is that? Two pages? Maybe, right? Insert fight here. <laughs> so that's four pages out of 32. We got 28 pages to shoot in four days. And this isn't cross coverage like Abbott, where he's got three cameras going at once. And oh, good. Look, the C camera got something cool. <laughs> So yeah. then when you put, when you're put into that kind of a position, how do you make your days and problem solve and get the job done? Okay. I think about that a lot and here are the following things and I reserve the right to like, <laughs> like I don't know, for, for other more experienced directors to tell me that this is, sounds crazy, but um, like every director that cares, like I prep the crap out of it, prep the crap out of it. There were times where we couldn't have time to go on a location scout. I would just make it happen. I would grab a couple of the people and I'm like, during lunch, can we go to this park? Cause we're going to be shooting in this park and we don't have time to go look at the park in advance. So I would do that. And then, um, I, I think what's, I think what helps me as a director on that show is that they're very story. They're very interested in the story and the writing. And I feel like at first they were kind of trusting a lot of writer directors. And I, and so when I know we have the performance or the thing, I can get out, you know, I, there was one time where I almost gave Ralph one take and it killed me. So we did two, we did two, but I, it was there on the first take. So we did one more, but I don't need to, if I have the performance and I have the story and it looks good, I don't have to do some fancy thing. Do you know what I mean? There's no, there, I mean, I like to, I like to, I like to pick my moments where you do a cool shot or you have a crane every once in a while. I remember once we had like, I felt like we had broomsticks taped together in a camera. I don't know what it was. It was not a crane, but we had a camera very up high with no crane. So like, we'll try, I'll try to do cool, interesting things every once in a while. But I feel like I can try to get out. I also feel, this is such a weird thing to say about myself, but I, I think there's other directors that I've seen do this. Can I'll talk about that? Because I kind of feel like, I, I saw Harold Ramis do this. I saw J.J. Abrams do this. And I try to emulate this. And how I feel inside is I'm extraordinarily appreciative of the crew and of the editors and of everybody that I work with. Extraordinarily. I know my place in there. And so I find that I try to express that appreciation as much as I can, because I feel like sometimes when you're just on a schedule where you're like this, 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 this it just can't get done. If I hear one department kind of thinking about something, it's not totally my place to get involved because I need to do 10 other things. I still want to represent their point of view with this. I want to connect the dots and connect the people because this, if this department is thinking one thing, this department is thinking another thing, it's going to end up slowing things down. But also there's just a communication thing where they're thinking, well, why don't they understand me? And why don't they understand me? It's just because there's not the time to do this. So I think I spend a lot of time trying to do that, you know, and trying to connect the dots. Um, but that said, I don't, I don't know. There, there are times where I honestly don't know. I think we had a 16 hour day and, um, this is probably something I shouldn't say, but an AD once said to me, I won't say what season, I won't say what it was. This is a 16 hour day. Then I said, why does it say 12 hours on the prep schedule? And they're like, that's all we have. <laughs> so I was like, all right. So when I know that, you know, I just don't linger at all once I have something, but that you have to be, yeah, it's scary. It's scary. You know, then the weight is on you. Why didn't you get this? You know? So, but yeah, those and are- you all, 
it also goes back to that idea of just being so decisive in how you make choices and not just what the choices are, but how you make those choices, right. what the heuristics are as far as like for you, it's important to bring everybody's voice together mm -hmm. and your level of appreciation for the people that are working on the show did not go unnoticed, even though I've never been on set to this day, just working with you, that was very clear. Okay. And one of the things that I've been trying to figure out for years are who are the people that I really gravitate towards that I either want to work with or that I want to talk to or that in general, I just want to be a part of my life. And mm -hmm. I found a really interesting theme and I hadn't really honed in on it completely until I kept asking why am I so driven to get you on the show specifically? And I'll tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. What I figured out is that I'm fascinated by people that have absolutely no business continuing to be nice to others when they cool. don't have to be. Because if you look at you on paper and what you've accomplished, mm -hmm. you have every right to be a diva and be an asshole and treat people like shit and be successful, yeah. <laughs> right? And I've met other people where it's the same, where it's like, you have no business being this nice. You don't have to be, mm -hmm. but you choose to be, which again uh -huh. goes to how you do anything is how you do everything. Uh -huh. That fascinates me. Thank you so much. I I I, yeah, I don't see another way. I, I It's so nice you say that. I, I just don't see another way. I feel like, the, 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 I didn't realize why I was writing for the longest time. I never really asked myself. I just knew I loved it. And then I realized it all clicked in and I like connecting people. I like putting a story on TV or in a movie that people who maybe are alone and thinking that they have this fear, they have this anxiety, they have this neurosis, whatever it is that they see themselves represented. Um, on screen and that they feel like, oh, they do that too. Somebody else does that too. So I very much, yeah, I very care. I very much care about people. I, I and it takes everybody to, to build anything good. It takes everybody. You need everybody. And not just from a, if everybody works, then I look better. I, I just think we, we all look better. We're all creating a thing. And if we're not doing, what are we here for? If we're not for that, right? Like, well, I'd be in a cave by myself somewhere, you know, <laughs> like, so yeah. And also I feel extraordinarily blessed and also very much want to help people come after me. There's nothing better. There's nothing better than trying to help other voices get in there, you know. Which to me goes back to this constant ongoing exploration I have of how does a show like Cobra Kai have any business being this good working <laughs> with the three showrunners? If mm -hmm. I were to distill it down to one thing, and there are a ton of different reasons this show is so good, but I'm interested to see if you agree with this perspective. It's mm -hmm. because with those three, it doesn't matter who you are, the best idea wins. Uh, yes. And I, yes, yes, yes. And I have to tell you something. I made that discovery at one point a little while ago. Oh my gosh. I don't want to. Okay. I'm not going to, I'm not <laughs> tell the audience. You're not going to tell them something, but I have worked with showrunners. I divided them into categories, people who were super passionate and when I, I'm going to say control freaks, but I don't mean control freaks in a necessarily bad way. I just mean that they have a very specific point of view of what they want. I'm going to say control, but it's I don't mean it in the negative way. But they're showrunners who are very passionate and a very good sense of what they want and very specific sense of what they want. And I divided them all into two camps. And I worked with two show, one that wasn't it wasn't as a showrunner at the time, and one showrunner who were that and had egos. The idea needed to come from them. It needed to be filtered to them. And they needed to have their stamp on it. And then I hadn't, it is absolutely John, Josh, and Hayden. And that's why I love, love, love working with them. But what I identified it as Greg Daniels, same thing. He does not care if you just, if you're a baby writer who started a week ago, or if you are somebody who's been there for eight years, the best idea wins. And that's the guys and that's Greg. And so I kind of like looked at every showrunner I'd ever worked with and was able to kind of divide them into these two camps of like people who have a very, because I think you have to have a good strong point of view in order to get anything good done. And they're passionate about what it is that they do, but some have egos and some don't. And I exclusively try to work with the ones who don't have the, and not because I need my idea to win, but it's just like, you know, what am I doing trying to help somebody else, you know, who wants it? It's just not as, it's not as interesting. It's not as enjoyable. Yeah. And I think you identified another key component to this creative process. The best idea wins, but if their vision sucks or they have no vision, it doesn't matter because it's yeah. a collection of random good ideas. Yes. And I've also never worked for showrunners that are more specific about what they want. And they will incessantly push you note after note after note after note until they're like, yep, that's what it is. Not yeah. because that was my idea and I want my vision. You can go in a totally different direction where they say, this scene needs to be blue. I can vision it blue. Then you make the red 
red version and they're like, okay, red is better, but here's my version of the red scene. Right. And I want to go into it and you tell me your ideas to now get it here, but it's not about, well, you can take their vision. You can totally change it and take them down a new path, but they still have an idea of this is the level that we need to get it to before we can walk away and say, yep, that's done. Now let's go ahead and lock it and move forwards. Yes. And I, and this may be the ADHD in me, but I just thought of one other thing that reminds me of from that other thing of like, what, what saves me time? And this is going to sound counterintuitive, but what saves me time is that I'm not afraid of not knowing what the hell I'm talking about. Like, I'm not afraid of not, 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 I'm not afraid of not having the answer. And I think there's there, when I first started directing, I remember Ed Helms was, I was nervous and he was just trying to be nice. And he gave me advice that everybody gives me, which is fake it till you make it. And I was like, I can't. <laughs> so like basically, but the, what, what, what's the good that comes out of it besides when I look like a fool and I'm embarrassed, you know, I'm, I'm moderately embarrassed is that, by saying it out loud, you then hear that three other people don't get it and two other people had a different idea of what it is. So if something is that a big discussion of this and this and this, and I'm like, can you just explain that again? Because I don't see how we can get from here to here. I feel like sometimes I'm in a situation where um, different people have different thoughts and nobody really understands what it is. So a lot more time is wasted trying to get the thing done. So I'm sort of the first to say, I know that's not probably true in every situation that you should do that, but I'm like, time out. I need to under, I, in order to direct this, I need to understand the intention here. If I don't understand the intention here and I don't understand how we're going to make this happen, you know, I can't just accept, you know, when you're saying that this can happen when two, three other people have different ideas, we need to talk about this. And so I'm okay saying like, let's all talk, let's all say exactly what we're thinking about what the solution is. And then sometimes people will be like, actually don't know. And they're like, oh, I'm glad I brought it up. <laughs> you know? so here's another one of those weird, crazy things I talked about earlier, where we can use our creative process to identify these patterns. Mm-hmm. I had a conversation for an hour today earlier with somebody you've never met in a totally different field completely talking mm-hmm. about the concept of faking it until you make it. No, I swear to God, I could I could send you the recording just to prove it. I won't for, you know, privacy reasons, but had this entire conversation in depth. And I want to throw this idea out to you to see if you would find this useful and if you would perhaps other people that are listening would find it useful as well. And I didn't necessarily come up with this concept, but I built upon it. Mm. I don't believe you should fake it until you make it because I feel that feels inauthentic. That feels like you're trying to put on a facade and lie. But how about if you had to face it until you make it? How about if you have to face the fact you don't know the answer and you just need to power through the discomfort and accept failure and just face it until you do know the answer? A hundred percent. I think that's brilliant. And it's like, face it. And, 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 and part of that is go with what you think the best answer is with what you know, right? You can't just sit there and sometimes and just think about it. You are in charge at this moment or it's your, it's on you. So you have to make the decision with what, you know, you can spend a second saying, I don't understand. Can you do this? Can you do this? And then you just got to go. I mean, the directing as opposed to writing, there are two different parts of my brain somehow. Um, but with directing, it's making a million decisions and at least 20% of them, I don't know if it's the correct decision, but I need to make a decision. There's departments counting. If I don't make a decision about this, this prop won't be ready in time, right? So yes, I totally agree. You have to face, you have to um, be brave enough to go forward, even if you don't completely know it. Try to get the answers. Try to uh, be collaborative and figure out who can help you um, if you don't know it. And then, yeah, be okay failing. And and it's there was a script supervisor from Abbott Elementary who's wonderful, who was telling me something like, if you do this, then whatever. And and, and he was correct, but I was like, I, you know, I, at that point he, he saves me a bunch, but I was like, I, that's, I don't need to do that. But I said, let them know if anybody questions you that you told me. And I said, no, you know what I mean? Cause it's like, it's on me. So you have to, especially in any kind of a leadership position, be okay, uh, making a decision because you can't sit and talk about it with 10 people all the time. Um, and then risk, oops, I made the wrong decision. <laughs> but again, going back to the same theme, how you do anything is how you do everything you're taking responsibility if it goes wrong, which is yet another conversation I had with somebody about this idea that whatever, like if you're uh, debating, I want to do this thing, or I want to do that thing, or I don't really want to share it with them, or I don't know how to connect with them and whatever it might be, as long as you're willing to take responsibility for it, as opposed to, well, if this goes wrong, I'm going to pin it on the assistant, or I'm going to pin it on this person. It just goes back to like, you're at a point in your career Or you can say, oh, yeah, that's the script supervisor's fault. They're not Mm going to question you, right? And then the Mm -hmm. script supervisor is going to eat a little bit of shit. They're going to be like, 
Right. I told Jen <laughs> that thing. She didn't yeah. listen. Now she threw yeah, me yeah. under the bus. Yeah, yeah. You're in a place in your career where you can easily get away with that, but you choose not to, yeah. which kind of goes to this larger hypothesis that I'm trying to prove to the industry is that we make better work and we are going to be more successful if we do it being nice people oh. and treating others with respect. But for some reason, there's this belief in this industry. The only way I get to the top is climbing over others. And I'm trying to prove that not only is that wrong, but it's not the path that's going to make you more successful. A hundred percent. And I have to tell you, I have never, I have had worked on, I've been so blessed to work on so many good sets. I have never been on a set as kind, as respectful, as well-organized as Abbott Elementary. Quinta Brunson is a genius and she is so beyond kind. She's very respectful. And people kept asking me like, what was it like to work with her? Like, you know, how, I, what was it? And my thing was, I, I, I'm learning every day. I'm learning about shots. I'm learning about lenses. I'm learning about things. I felt like I became a better person being around her because she, and um, there's a little bit of a cliche about this right now is that women sometimes apologize too much. And I do sometimes in my words and sometimes in my behavior. And I don't, I will always, I'm strong and I'll do what I want to do. And, you know, sometimes I'll feel badly about something later, but I'll do it, but I'll say sorry. And I'll have those words first in, or I'll just kind of, I don't know, I'll defer something. And again, when it's big decisions, I'll go forward. She doesn't do that. She doesn't do that. She does not like say, Oh, I'm sorry. Or, Oh, that she, and I felt like she, every decision that the people there are extraordinarily kind, everybody. And I, I have not experienced this. Their hours are short. I mean, they, they, they get in, they work very hard, they get out. And I know they have three cameras going at all times, but you know, we were wrapping at three o'clock some days, you know, it, it, it I'm just, just going to assume you mean AM because it couldn't even be possible to wrap at no, 3 p.m. No, it's p.m. It's wow. p.m. When the crew was going to go on strike, the producer, you know, basically said, you guys are family. And we understand, you know, we just, just a talking to them like human beings. There's a, it, it, it it, it is so beautiful. One of the actresses at the end of the show this past uh, that I directed came out and said, uh, you know, I didn't know what she was doing because everybody started coming in the hallway. And she's like, I just want you to know that the while we were here putting this show together this week, there was a birth, there was a death and not not on the show. But um, and I I just want you to know that uh, you guys are all extremely important. What you do here is important. You are all so valued and you are all so important. And, you know, it was just, there's that vibe going on. It's just infused in the show. So I am so happy. I'm so grateful to be a part of it. And I'm so grateful that the people that are coming up, there's a bunch of baby writers are seeing that it can be done this way. These writers are not working late. They have wonderful storytelling. So they're doing great job, but they just, you know, Anyway. Well, I'm hoping that with the with this the the change of the guard, so to speak, or of these younger generations coming up, that this yeah. idea of you just have to pay your dues with the 80 hour weeks and you know, it just it doesn't matter how you treat people, you just gotta climb to the top. I really hope that we just uh, eliminate those beliefs and they become all but extinct. Um, yeah. but it just it takes one person at a time, one director at a time, one showrunner at a time to show that it's acceptable. I agree. So, I agree. You know, I, I love agree. talking to people that can both be incredibly successful at the top of their game, but they've done it bringing other people with them rather than putting them down to get where they are, which again, the whole reason I wanted to have you on the show. <laughs> so I have one other topic that I just continually try to get in and I can never find kind of the right segue to it, but you continue to allude to it. And I want to dig into it a little bit deeper. Hmm. You may not have even noticed, but you've said multiple times, maybe it's because of the ADHD. That's been a pre-qualifier for a lot of your conversations. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about this a little bit because this is a big part of my journey. It's a huge topic of conversation I've talked about since literally interview number one and episode number one eight years ago mm -hmm. was the fact that I was diagnosed with adult onset ADD and it was just like my entire world was shaken. And mm -hmm. I'm curious, what is your origin story as far as better understanding how your brain works? Is it just a matter of a lot of people say, oh, I'm so ADD or if you and my guess is you've really dug into it to better understand it and identify how your brain works. So what's yes. your origin story when it comes to your neurodiversity? My origin story is that when I was young, um, I, I ended up sort of. <laughs> testing into sort of, you know, you know, when you were real little, it kind of you take these tests and I go into sort of more of these um, advanced classes. 
but I was unbelievably disorganized. I mean, unbelievably. And just, um, like, you know, I came home without a tutu once from a dance class with one shoe once, like, where's the shoe? But I didn't know where the shoe was. I once didn't have a jacket. And I actually that I said, another girl was cold, but I had no idea what other girl it was. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, so part of it was just, I wanted to help, but, but I ripped a page out of the encyclopedia when it's like back when encyclopedias were expensive to like tape it on my paper. So, and, and in fifth or sixth grade, they gave out awards to the entire grade. And for some reason they gave real awards like MVP and best listener and best. They gave me most organized as a joke. (laughs) (laughs) There's a memory you're never going to forget. There's a core memory. So it was, so then I also had procrastination. I had a lot of things where I had to bump up the intensity, the adrenaline, the excitement. I had one teacher, I'm going to tell this quickly, because I don't know, but I had this one professor in college who basically said, 80% of your grade is going to be a paper and I'm not going to accept it late. And I'm not going to accept it late. Every week he said this, 20% is your attendance, 80% is this paper. I'm not going to accept it late. I always would have my paper printing out back when we would print out papers, printing out and running to class, right? I mean, I would do it the night before and stay up all night. My grade were better when I did that than when I did things in advance. I just couldn't get the adrenaline up and the challenge and the interest enough to focus. So my focus was scattered. So the he scared me so much. And I was in college of communications now. So I just wanted to do well that I, for the first time ever did a paper in advance ever. And because of that, it wasn't printing out of my printer. I go to class. I don't have my paper. <laughs> I had done it three days before. I didn't have it because I was so nervous that I wasn't going to remember to do it, that I did it in advance, but because it wasn't printing out of the printer, I didn't have it. So I go up to him after class and I said, you know, I'm, um, every, he, I'm just hearing there's a line of kids and they're like, I don't have it. He's like, sorry, done, failed. I don't have it failed. And, And I, I said, listen, the only reason I don't have the paper is because it is the very first time I have ever done something in advance. It meant so much to me that this is the only time I've ever not procrastinated. And it is for that reason (laughs) that I don't have my paper. And he's like, okay, you can go get it. I am going to mark you down either a grade or half a grade. I don't remember. But like, he didn't, he just was like, that's too crazy to not be, you know, that has to be true. So I ran and I got it. But I knew I had struggled with it. And then I went to therapy kind of more for like OCD and some other things, knowing that pretty much knowing from my mom, who's a psychologist and worked with kids with ADD and also worked with kids, but wanted to find every other reason that a kid could have this issue as opposed to that. Like she doesn't like to diet. She's not a kid, not passing out the Ritalin or trying to like diagnose everybody. So I kind of knew from her, I took a screener test and it's, you know, it said if you have 14 out of 20 or ADD and I had nine. 19 out of 20 and 19 out of 20 is like five out of five. <laughs> so then I got tested for it and they said I did. And it, it all just, all of a sudden, everything just made sense. Like everything, the fact that I love challenges, the fact that I procrastinate, the fact that, oh, this is so embarrassing, but I'll share it. Um, uh, so every once in a while, I'll just forget to put deodorant on, but more often than I should, like maybe eight times in my life, I would put deodorant under one arm And between that arm and this arm, I get distracted. (laughs) So I would go to work and I remember it happened at least twice on the office. And I smelled under one of my arms, but not under the other. And I would like try to figure out who to sit with based on like how I I smelled. I really, I really was friends with someone. I might face them towards the, so Anyway, so I ended up having to do a lot of things for my brain to sort of, and and a lot of it was acceptance. And my mom would say with her clients and with other people, she would say like creative brains and people who have empathy and sensitivity and are perceptive and all the qualities that make you a great creative person and oftentimes just a person, empathy, the ability to understand another situation to write about them, that their brains are kind of like this. They've got the good stuff and then they've got this other stuff because it often comes with anxiety and depression and attention issues. And there's so, common in the creative brain. And she would say, you can't throw away the good stuff and keep that. You can't throw away the bad stuff and keep the good stuff. So it's a matter of how do you find the tools to help with the bad stuff, but to honor the fact that, you know, the flip side of that crap is I get to have a cool brain that can come up with inventive things. So I think honestly, just almost accepting it and realizing the flip side was good was a lot of it. And then many other things. I wrote a movie. I quit the office, which was my best job ever to write a movie. 
about the life of a man. It's one moment from every year of his life. It starts before he's born and it's like a flip book. Scenes are like 15 seconds to two minutes. And I listened to Thunderstorms maybe 3,000 times while I wrote that movie because it kept me engaged enough and I would take a hairband and kind of do this so that all I just would do move this, have this, and I could focus. So I know that was way longer. <laughs> no, that was absolutely fascinating. And the, the problem that you've now created is we're going to have to figure out where we can find more hours in the day. Because I'm just going to need to have you be one of my ADHD coaches and psychologists. Because <laughs> boy, do you understand the way that this works. Oh, and this is something you. that I've been talking about for years in this podcast and the coaching program, something that I've dealt with for most of my adult life. Oh. Um, but like you said, the first thing when it comes to understanding this is accepting that it is what it is. Like, it's not like you you can't be fixed. And the reason you can't be fixed is because you're not broken. Yes. Oh, it's that beautiful. you just, you need to understand what are the good parts and what are the bad parts and have the tools to manage both. Because mm-hmm. I still to this day, like literally to today, not like to this day in general, to today, mm-hmm. I will do something and I will say out loud, God, I hate my brain. No, oh. I don't hate my brain. I'm very thankful for it. But when things like this happen, it drives me crazy. Mm. But I accept that it is what it is. And I find the tools to overcome it. But I still fall into that trap of just getting so frustrated with certain things that I struggle with that most quote unquote normal people would be like, uh, you just put the deodorant under the other arm. You know, it's not hard, right? You're like, but you don't get it. I had the best idea of the week between the left arm and the right arm. And I'm not going to forget it. I got to get it on the paper, right? I know exactly when you were telling that story, I was like, oh, my God, I understand this so much more than you can even possibly imagine. (laughs) That's amazing. And and for me, it wasn't I hate my brain. For me, it was I'm lazy and stupid. That Mm. was my thing over and over and over. Now, I don't do it as much, but like that's my default because I would do a a math test. I would, you know, forget, didn't have a good memory, have to relearn the logic of the puzzle, do the puzzle, but do a careless error at the end. And I would get it wrong. And I, I understood all of it about that, but I didn't care about that. I cared about, I got it wrong. It's math. I got it wrong. I'm, you know, too lazy to have learned to to do it carefully. I'm too stupid to have gotten it right. Yeah. That was the mantra in my head. And at some points it maybe, maybe helped drive me maybe, you know, cause I wanted to prove something, but more often I had to kind of realize that no, no, no. (laughs) <laughs> this is something you're telling yourself. It is not. It's not yeah, it's, it's a story that we tell ourselves, right? Story. Going back to this idea of being storytellers, we tell this story that, oh, I'm broken or I hate my brain or I'm so stupid or I'm so lazy yeah. or whatever it might be. Yes. But I feel like the first step is I just accept this is the hand that I was dealt. Mm-hmm. And now I have a choice going back to this idea of making choices, right? Mm-hmm. Either I can choose to consider it a disability and consider it my kryptonite, or I can develop the tools to turn it into a superpower. It doesn't Uh, mean that the disability or the kryptonite isn't there like on a daily basis. There are day-to-day things about how I manage my life where my wife is just like, I mean, come on, like (laughs) what, right? But we need that to have all the best parts. So I'm curious if we could distill it down of all the things they use to, to manage, whatever it might be, if there's one tool that you use to allow the way your brain works to be your superpower and not your kryptonite, what do you think it is? I think... I think it might be acceptance because I think that when I accept it, they're going to write about my experience. And when I can write about my experience, people can relate to it and people can relate to it. Then I feel like I'm bringing people together. Do you know what I mean? I feel like the superpower literally might be the thing itself. You know, um, uh, I had an idea that I couldn't quite crack, but I'll just tell you it. It was an animated movie where a kid gets uh, a adolescent boy gets bit by a, you know, radioactive ladybug or I don't know, some radioactive insect and uh, gets anxiety <laughs> and then learns how to, you know, deal with the bad and the good, like learns that he's like wants to climb walls. He wants to be Spider-Man. He wants to be everything else. But then he basically is anxiety. He learns to kind of focus the, oh, I'm over hyper-focusing on what could go wrong. So now I have solutions for 15 different problems. So now I'm prepared, Do you know, like I, I'm not sleeping as much, but I'm using that time to end. But also he finds ways to corral it and, you know, not have it get the best of him. So he like learns to use his superpower, which is anxiety. So it's like, I'm always playing around with the idea that something that's bad, that's, you know, people think of bad is there's a flip side, but yeah. 
So awareness definitely, I think, is a, is a very, very important tool. Yeah. I think awareness is a tough one to actually put on a calendar or to do list, right? Yes, if you're like, yes. I'm going to make a little checkbox. Be aware of your neurodiversity today think, at 2 p.m. I think it's um, I think I, I don't know if I could narrow it down, but I think it's that I find find the thing that you're for me, find the thing that you're passionate about because it's going to make you, you know, really hyper focus on it and you're going to really enjoy it make small goals, make small goals. Don't be, oh, don't set ridiculous goals, set goals that you can achieve. I worked with a showrunner who wasn't coming in. He was wonderful, but he wasn't coming in and approving outlines. I made a sticker chart for him. And if he got 30 stickers, cause he read outlines, then he would get this prize that I knew he'd love. <laughs> so like, even when you, when you're super successful, you know, like you like getting rewards. And so you have to have wins. And so for a brain that is not typical, um, having, setting it up, setting you up to succeed, Succeed, finding the tools. And one of them is creating small goals that I mocked and, and, and embracing that, you know, no, I need to do this. And, and yeah. Right. So now I have the very distinct and unique opportunity of giving you a note because you've given me many, many, many notes yes, before. Please. And I'm going to throw one note at you and I want to see what you think. Yes. Everything you said, I agree with except for one. Oh yeah. There's one thing that you said that I think it'd be very dangerous for people, which is oh. don't set big, ridiculous goals, set oh. small goals. And my feeling is, at least from what I've learned, mm -hmm. is that you start with setting the ridiculous goal, but then you break it down into a series of much, much smaller ones and pieces. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Good. Exactly. And that's what I, mean. what I assumed yes, it was. Yes. I wanted to make I, sure that we, we were on the same page. I 100% mean that. I just am not eloquent. But yeah, no, I when when I was going to write my short story, I was going to write a short story or, and then I was going to use it as a sample. I was going to submit it to the New Yorker. My goals were big, but mm -hmm. uh, I had to break down the process of it into winnable chunks. Good. So I, I wanted but, to clarify because I assumed we were on the same yeah, page. No, we were. But we anybody were, we were. listening that wouldn't yes. have assumed that, they're like, no. oh, okay, so I, I need to stop shooting for the stars and set very real. No, no, small no, goals. no. Always shoot for the stars. Always. That's all I do. That's all I yeah. do. It, it, I wrote this movie that I wrote. I, I, I only thought about story and character. It had 90 speaking roles. My my producer ran it through the final draft check and she said, not this many people spoke in Ben Hur. And I said, well, I love Ben Hur. I just wish more people spoke. And she's like, okay. <laughs> but you reach for the stars. Go put it as high as you can, but break those down into six winnable, successful chunks. So you don't lose the motivation and you can keep going. So now yeah. we agree on everything. So. We, we, to we totally agree. So I rescind my note officially. <laughs> um, but if, if I were to wake up and say my goal for the week is I'm going to lose half a pound, that's not going to get me out of bed and I could give two shits. But if right, my goal right. is I want to crush the course on American Ninja Warrior oh, and the next yes. step is I've got to lose half a pound, well, then I'm going to break it down into what do I do every hour 100%. of every day to be able to, to hit that one little tiny goal, right? But it has to be attached to something that has a lot more meaning and purpose Meaning. and like you said that lights yes. you up that lights you up and and i um yes and i'm glad you gave me that note because actually when i say it i say it like i said it and it is not understandable because i don't talk about the larger goals i talk about breaking things into chunks so it i assume yeah i assume things that yeah everyone's inside my brain that's clearly not the case <laughs> which is another one of those crazy things about adhd is you yes, speak yes. and you're like don't you understand all the ideas that are coming out of my head and people are like right. no yes. i'm sorry what now which again i found is one of the things i've learned to develop as a skill as a podcast caster because I have to take very complex ideas uh, and on the fly in the middle of a live conversation distill it down to the essence of those ideas and as I'm sure you've learned one of the other things that has to, to do with ADHD is you talk really fast because you have so <laughs> many ideas that are bottlenecking at your mouth and you just want to crush them all out yes right so I've had to learn how do I speak more slowly and more succinctly oh. my ability to do that with all the ideas in my head comes from putting myself in front of the microphone. So again, it's it, it's just this idea of what processes can you put into your day that allow you to work through these challenges as your own form of therapy or literally just going to therapy, which yes. again, to me is one of those top tools to manage and develop that awareness that we talked about is you have to work through it. Oh, 100%, 100%. Yeah, you're so good at distilling ideas and quickly. <laughs> because I force myself to do it all the time because it's something that used to be very much my kryptonite. Oh. I would just talk and talk in circles and have all these ideas and way too fast. And like, we have no idea what you just said. Yeah. So I identified that was my kryptonite. How do I turn it into my superpower? Oh, that's but amazing. it takes time. And I broke it down into very small doable goals. And it was not, well, I don't have a podcast. So now I want to become Tim Ferriss and I want to get a million downloads a day. It's <laughs> what if I just have one episode? Huh. What, 
all right, well, what does it take to do one episode? Well, you yeah. have to learn how to do this and install your microphone and that, like break it down to a series of checklists, right? Okay, great. Now let's do it a second time. And now right. here I am doing it roughly 300th time, but wow. it's all part of that process and identifying what are those areas that I struggle with and how do I get better at them, which I think just is one of the reasons that you and I just kind of, we had this, this connection that I felt almost immediately when we were working yes. together. A hundred percent. Our brains are very similar. <laughs> it's yes, very, very, cool. very similar. For sure. <laughs> so is there anything before we wrap up? Because uh, given that I talk about time management and we are now officially a minute over, my oh, OCD yes. is like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm one minute late talking to Jen. And I'm sure you're just completely and totally offended by it. Um, yeah, yeah. Is there any question that I have not asked or anything we've talked about that's important to you to share before we wrap up? Um. I would say this isn't, I don't know, this isn't a very big point. So, um, but I would say that I take in my career from the beginning, I took calculated risks uh, and I would, as soon as I made any money, I would save it. I would really save it. And that has afforded me the ability to do the things that light me up. So I can be picky now um, and I can, you know, when I basically can pick like, oh, this guy's a jerk. I don't want to work with him. And this person's wonderful. I want to wait till an opportunity there, or I really just love, I, I, I will do things to pay the bills to then to be able to afford to do the things that I love. I absolutely do that. And I would say cal taking calculated risks, not getting stuck. If you're not growing and moving, uh, and you, there's no, they're, they're not going to promote from within. And you feel that you've learned as much as you can from a place, take the risk and leave. And if you've saved enough money to give you a little bit of a cushion so you can afford those risks, I feel like it ends up working out in the end. Oh my God, that could easily be another two-part interview for three entire hours. I mean, I'm building an entire section of this program, it, helping it, people manage their finances so they can say no to the wrong opportunities. I and say no all like, the time. My agents want to kill me. And again, oh, my, ag my agents, they've just stopped reaching out because I just continually say no over and over and over. But I'm sure that you've had similar conversations, but people will ask me like, that's so great in the today's day and age with all the, the calendars and the way that the shows line up and you don't work 10 months a year on a show anymore. Yeah. You've been able to stick with Cobra Kai in season two. I'm like, that's not an accident. That's because I say no to everything else because I want to be available. That costs a lot of money to be able to say no and be able to consistently stay on a show that's only five, six, seven months a year at best, especially with the gap with the pandemic. Oh. It didn't just come together. I wasn't lucky was that I was choices. available. There's so many choices I had to make so that I could work on the entire show back to back to back to back to back. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I never would have been available, which is why very rarely when you look at the roster of shows nowadays, either the editors, the writers, the directors, you don't see those people that are just going from season to season no, to season. You don't. Yeah. Almost like every season is season one. I didn't just think so about frustrating. That. I do the same exact thing you do. I find people that I love and projects that I love that are challenges and I stick with them. That's it, you know, and then I'll wait them out. You can't do that if you suck at managing your money, though. Right, right. Yes, exactly. So again, I, I think that there are at least 10 different rabbit holes that we could to open up for 10 different uh, additional parts of this. But I do want to be uh, very, very conscious of your time. And thank you for your time. But if anybody is listening today, that's either inspired by you inspired by your work, what's the easiest way to learn more about you get a hold of you connect with you? Um, I think Instagram, probably. Um, I'm just kind of newish to that. Instagram and Facebook I'm on. So yeah, Jay Salata, J-C-E-L-O-T-T-A on Instagram. I, I started thinking about putting together a website and I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't focus on it enough. So maybe at some point, but right now that's probably it. Um, and Harley Copen is my agent at CAA, if, you know, it's any sort of Well, work. I will definitely make sure that the, the links to your Facebook and Instagram page are in the show notes for this episode, because something tells me if the right person reaches out with the right amount of value, you probably probably want to help them succeed. Yeah. And I surround myself with people that have that same philosophy. 100%. Uh, so on that note, Jen, my God, was this a pleasure? I can't believe again, talk about ADHD and time blindness. I feel like we started four minutes ago. Me too. How we started 90 <laughs> minutes ago was beyond me. That makes I'm sure no that sense. it makes absolutely no sense. Cause I feel like I just said hello to you and I don't know how it's 90 minutes later. Um, but this has been an absolute pleasure. Can't thank you enough for your time and your expertise and being here to inspire my audience today. So thank you. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. What a treat. Bye-bye. <laughs>